Okay. Dear Professor Klausen, dear Kesslin, dear Professor Reich, as an important co-organizer of this event, dear Andreas Kellenholz from the European Institute here at the uh, University of Zürich, dear colleagues, dear students, dear guests. First of all, I would like to warmly welcome you, dear Kesslin Kloss. After a very long time and many postponements, mm -hmm. which have to do with the pandemic, we could finally find an unfortunately very short window of opportunity for your nice. visit. It is a great pleasure and honor to have you here with us. Professor Klausen is a professor at the University of Miami School of Law and non-resident senior fellow at the Georgetown Institute of International Economic Law, co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of International Economic Law, and a member of the Executive Council and Executive Committee of the American Society of International Law. Her publications devoted primarily to issues of international economic law, international investment protection law, and international dispute settlement law have appeared in leading journals. Prior to her academic career, Kathleen Klassen served as Associate General Counsel at the Office of the United States Trade Representative in the White House, and as a legal counsel at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague after graduating, as already said, in Yale. Professor Klausen will introduce us today to a topic that some, like me, may not be particularly close to thematically, but which ultimately has implications for the entire, entire global economy, US trade policy. In this context, I can make a meaningful point to everyone. In view of my first meeting with Kathleen, I naturally wanted to read up a bit and look into her publications. Fortunately, not only can Professor Clausen's impressive list of publications be found on the internet, but a substantial portion of her contributions are also available in full text as PDFs. I have read through some of these texts, and uh, despite their impressive size, they are extraordinarily easy to understand and read, and they make the basic lines and changes in American trade policy very clear, even to a social security lawyer. It's me, so uh, I think I got quite some points out of it. As a European, one is always amazed at how vividly American academics can describe problems and make connections plausible. The topic Professor Clausen will talk about today could hardly be more timely. In the past years, the United States have abandoned its traditional role-leading efforts to remove trade barriers. At the same time, progress to liberalize trade multilaterally under the umbrella of the WTO has uh, stalled. This not only affects the US, but also Switzerland. As a small and open economy, Switzerland relies on a rules-based order of international order while having limited influence to shape these very rules. This is why the question to what degree the Biden administration's trade policy differs from Trump's should be of great interest to all of us. However, you have all not come to hear my speculations about what <laughs> Professor Klausen might say, but to hear her herself in the original right now. Before I now give you the floor, dear Kathleen, I would like to thank you again very much for coming to us in these difficult times and for giving this conference to us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, um, Thomas. Thank you, Dean, for this very, very generous introduction. And thank you also for, for making time to be here in your very busy schedule. Uh, you are, are so kind. Um, I want to thank everybody who has made this visit possible uh, before beginning. I'm honored to be back in Zurich. Uh, this was uh, the last place I was pre-pandemic. Uh, and so it, it seems appropriate that it's also my first trip abroad as well to come back to Zurich as a very uh, special home in my heart. Um, and I'm honored to be here as guest professor on this visit with the law faculty at this world renowned university and grateful to all of you for making the trip out here on this year about this topic on this uh, rainy snowy day. I want to particularly thank uh, Professor Dr. Johannes Wright for making this happen. Johannes, thank you for your patience in, in getting me here, as we heard from the Dean after many months of work. Uh, it is an honor to work alongside you, so I'm very grateful. I also want to thank the law faculty for putting together this talk and the Institute, 
It is an honor to be here through the hosting of the, of the Institute as well. So the last time I was here, I mentioned this was right before the pandemic. Uh, it was a little less uh, snowy, uh, and there was also a little bit more pessimism. Pessimism about US-European relations, pessimism about the future direction of the multilateral trading system. This was October of 2019, and most of the world at that time was talking about the tweets of our commander in chief, <laughs> not so much about vaccines yeah. or the letters of the Greek alphabet that we all have to know now. Both moments, I think, can be characterized as very difficult ones for the world for different reasons. And I had the privilege back in October of 2019 of giving a talk also to the law faculty members of the faculty here. And my chosen topic then was the trade war, the so-called trade war, because it had really taken off in that moment. We had tariffs flying in all directions and we're really coming to the peak of this so-called trade war in the, in the thick of it. The tariffs, of course, seeming contrary to many of our trading partners, contrary to the rules to which we had committed that you heard from the Dean. We also at that time seemed to have the World Trading Organization, World Trade Organization hanging by a thread. Right? It had been a blockage of the appellate body and, and a step away from the work of the organization in many respects, a step away and abandoning of trade agreements more generally, at the same time trying to remake trade agreements in different ways. It was a tumultuous time, needless to say, for trade law. It was an uncertain time above all. So what has changed? Well, now I'm here in December, a little bit of snow, and I'm here to bring uh, joy and good tidings <laughs> consistent with the season. Uh, unfortunately, I have no ho, ho, ho to share, uh, but if we ask most commentators this question, what has changed? They, I think, would say not much, not much. We still have tariffs. We still don't have an appellate body. And to a large degree, we are not embracing, we are not liberalizing trade through a push toward more trade agreements. So the title of the talk, as you heard it, U.S. Trade Policy from Trump to Biden, what has changed? We could say very little. Here ends the talk. Thank you. <laughs> I, I will go on. I will go on. I will go on because I think there are some key changes. I think there are some key changes that are worth investigating, acknowledging, understand what is happening in this moment, a very different moment in many respects from October 2019. I want to focus on three aspects in particular, troubles, tools, and tone. Troubles, tools, and tone. Start with the troubles. The troubles, I think, are very much the same. The administration, this administration, is facing many of the same troubles that the last administration faced in part because the last administration wasn't able to solve those troubles necessarily. It maybe didn't make as much progress as had been hoped in dealing with them. So what are these troubles? Well, first and foremost, I think it's clear to say the problem, and at least in most uh, the eyes of most US government officials is China. Problem with the capital P. China, its behaviors uh, writ large, its treatment of US companies and other um, international companies its rising dominance as a result of this bad behavior. And then there are sub troubles, if you will, that come out of this. There's overcapacity in steel and aluminum. There's forced technology transfer and IP theft. There is a WTO seem, seemingly having failed in disciplining uh, the China problem. And perhaps little serious cooperation, or so it seemed uh, in earlier years, from allies in trying to take on this problem, not seeing it perhaps as deeply as US officials did. So that's the first big trouble. The second trouble that I think was seen by the last administration and also by this one is a perception to which many Americans and perhaps many abroad as well, to which many Americans subscribe that, that trade agreements, trade agreements and trade liberalization more generally have had a negative impact on US workers on domestic economies. And I think this is in line with what many have described, of course, in, in more expert terms and in more popular terms as a dissatisfaction with the international order more generally. 
These are the troubles. These are the troubles that I think both administrations have been concerned about. They haven't changed very much. They remain front and center in the minds of the different White Houses. And I think I might also add to this, this administration would put climate change as a further trouble on its list. Whether trade tools can deal with that, I think remains to be seen. Of course, there's a lot of work happening in that space in many countries today. But the Biden administration, in contrast with the prior administration, has a very different starting point in addressing these troubles. That brings me perhaps to the tools. So let's go from, from the troubles that are largely the same to the tools where I think we've seen a little bit of a shift. When the Biden administration came into office earlier this year, it was facing the implementation of the tools of the last administration. And so again, what were those? The tariffs in place, and not just on products coming from China, but also products coming from many other parts of the world, including here, under a security justification, a security a concept of economic security uh, that we discussed at length in my last visit, plus a deal that had been negotiated with China to try and deal with some of this, uh, and then a paralyzed appellate body. There's another tool from the last administration, plus a new North American free trade agreement that was negotiated. You may know one of the big achievements uh, of the last administration was to conclude this new agreement to replace the 1990s agreement, the North American free trade agreement. Now we have this new agreement called the US-Mexico-Canada agreement. And, and so the new administration is coming in facing this landscape a very different one from, from the last phase uh, in 2016-2017, and all under the shadow of a pandemic, which of course has its own difficulties. So what tools then have the Biden administration used? What are the shifts to which I uh, am referring? Well, of course, first the Biden administration has kept many of those tariffs on, as we said earlier, but there have been efforts to remove those with allies. The ones with China remain on, but those on products coming from allied countries have been removed or in the process of being removed. They've also removed the threat of putting on still more tariffs. Secondly, with respect to the appellate body, well, we still have you know, appellate body of the World Trade Organization, but we do have greater engagement in other areas of WTO work, I think it's fair to say. Indeed, the U.S. trade representative, the lead official in the U.S., government on trade policy, went to Geneva already in her first six months in her new role to talk about the importance of the WTO. That was a trip that her predecessor never made in his four years. And looking at that new North American agreement, the tool that was negotiated by the last administration, this one is advancing that further by enforcing the rules under that agreement. So again, some continuity in tools, some change, some new developments coming out of that space. We go now to tone. So troubles, we repeat the same. Tools, a little bit of change. Tone, a great deal of change. A great deal of change in tone from the last administration to this one. Here are the differences. More cooperation, greater, a greater cooperative approach. More engagement on issues of trade policy rather than a sort of go it alone approach. Uh, a commitment, at least in word and in some respects in deed, on a commitment to the rules-based order, re-articulating some of the, the importances of the rules. And last, in tone, a naming of a constituency. Now this, I need to say a little bit more about what I mean by that. In the last administration, there was at least a perception among many that the administration was working in the furtherance uh, of the steel industry primarily the steel industry, a few other sort of favorite industries that were favored in their, in their policies. Um, but this administration, by contrast, has put forward from the very beginning a more inclusive, uh, at least a more inclusive sounding trade policy, we'll get into the details in a moment, what it calls the worker-centered trade policy. Worker-centered trade policy is the catchphrase for this administration, something that it uses in all of its statements, its press releases, everything you see coming out of the US Trade Representative's office talks about this worker-centered trade policy, putting workers at the center of the conversation, naming that group 
uh, more than the last administration uh, did. So the goals are similar. It's to address those troubles. They're both trying, both have tried and trying to resolve those troubles. Both, I think, dealing with the question of what do they think the U.S. economy should look like in five to 10 years? What's the vision? What does that look like in the global context? Both wanted to and now wanting to effectuate a paradigm shift. Ambassador Lighthizer, the, the former USTR in the last administration, made this point very expressly. He talked about a redesign of the rules, something I think made many people very nervous. What does that mean? Are we abandoning? We, we like the system. What are we going to do? But something that I argued back then and, and still think now wasn't a full a turn away from the rules. This uh, administration, all the more so thinking about a redesign that's still consistent with those principles. So both of them, I think, also thinking about this in a security lens, but the tone, again, is different. When I was here also in 2019, I talked a little bit about how the, the tariffs were the tool specific to Ambassador Lighthizer, that gentleman who was selected to be the US trade representative, he really wanted to use this tariff tool, something called Section 301 of our 1974 Trade Act. That's what he thought would be, would be used to correct for the troubles, seeing the WTO as insufficient in addressing the China threat. Again, yeah, this administration, I think, shares some of that view back to the tools, continuing the tariffs, using this paralysis of the WTO to advance some other uh, goals. Uh, but in lieu of doing more negotiations, I said the last administration negotiated a number of new deals to try and reorient them more towards US interests. This administration is enforcing those rules. So less negotiation, more enforcement. And actually, if you come hang out uh, on Capitol Hill with members of Congress, uh, you will hear enforcement is the buzzword. Everyone wants more enforcement of trade rules. Uh, one of the key words that is sort of floating around in the relationship between Congress and the executive. What are you doing to enforce our trade rules to keep us on top? Enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. Also, let's create some new rules, new tools. You hear a lot of that as well as resilience in supply chains, which of course is related very much to the pandemic. But let's talk about enforcement in the context of this worker-centered trade policy. I want to spend the majority of, of, of time here talking about what that means, because it really is such the centerpiece of this policy uh, that we need to understand it to understand what might happen going forward. Worker-centered trade policy, I mentioned it's everywhere. It's, it's in addition to sort of enforcement being the buzzword, this is the, the catchphrase through all the cool cats and kittens are using if you want to blend in with the trade community, you got to say worker-centered trade policy. Mm -hmm. But it requires, of course, some unpacking. So let's do that now. What or who is the worker, we might ask? What does it mean to have that individual centered in trade policy? And more specifically, what does that mean for a, a, a future in five to 10 years? What, would, what kind of economy are we talking about? I think a number of people believe this phrase is one without meaning. It's a gimmick, just something that's used by the administration to sound, to appeal to the base, to appeal to its party. But I don't share that view. I think it's at the forefront of the thinking of our trade officials. And in spending some time with Ambassador Tai, uh, our, the US Trade Representative, about a year ago, preparing her for her new role, she expressed that to me. I have this sense that in every trade policy decision that is being made, they're thinking about it through this lens. What will be the impact on workers if we make this decision? And I think there are three buckets of workers, three different types of workers that are now coming through as we understand this policy a bit better. Workers at home, workers abroad, and workers under duress. By workers at home, I refer to not just those individuals who are working within the United States, but also how they are treated in the trade policy making apparatus. What are the procedural or administrative uh, features of our trade policy that engage with workers in the United States. And workers abroad, here we're going to talk a bit about our trade agreements and what they have to say 
about workers abroad. We have tools in our trade agreements, you may know, for enforcing labor standards. This sometimes surprises folks who are not uh, in this trade space all the time, but we have, just as other countries have, uh, these, these commitments in our trade agreements that where each government promises to meet a certain standard in their labor laws, to adopt and maintain particular labor laws, and then to enforce them uh, progressively after the signing of the agreement. So these are trade tools. They are labor commitments in trade agreements. Uh, and again, fairly, uh, the United States has been very much at the front end of that, of that uh, movement to put more labor commitments in trade agreements. Workers under duress, by that I'm referring to forced labor. And I'll talk a little bit about why I split that out as its own category, because of course there it's also workers abroad, but I think they, it deserves a special mention. So we'll come to that. So I want to talk a bit about these three manifestations of the worker-centered trade policy, these three buckets, and a bit about the scorecard or how they're being received. These three areas, that I might stop to say, have been prior to the Biden administration, reasonably separate in US trade policy. They are, for different reasons, they are, there are statutes that say, well, issues of workers at home are going to be part of the Department of Labor. Issues of workers abroad go to this agency. Forced labor is a different agency. And so before we got to this worker-centered trade policy, these were relatively siloed. You had different bureaucrats working on each one. So one effect of just calling something a worker-centered trade policy and thinking about these holistically is actually having these government officials start to talk to one another about what this could mean, how they could see trade policy as interacting across these three zones. It has forced a conversation across these differently situated agencies. And I think those interconnections of themselves are very interesting, but we'll take them one by one uh, today. One big question that I would pose to you before we go through these in greater detail is whether this is a trade policy at all, or is this a labor policy? Is this a worker-centered trade policy or a trade-centered worker policy? Or is it just a worker policy that has implications for trade? There are different views on this and I'll let you make up your own mind. Let's start with workers at home. We start with workers at home because it is the most challenging, I think, to discern. As we heard from the Dean at the outset, this, in this, this tradition, let's call it, this norm of trade liberalization over the last 60 years, more exports have been the focus, more market access has been the focus, the free movement of goods and services. The thinking has been that to help workers at home, we will create more opportunity if we lower these barriers to trade. We will create jobs, we will create prosperity for workers at home through this liberalization activity. This message clearly has lost its charm among much of the US populace. There is, I think, a distrust of how successful it could be. It is seen by some as benefiting big corporations and the domestic strategies that the government had put in place to try to deal with perhaps what might be some of the fallout, those domestic strategies have uh, been seen to have failed. So here, to now address what we can do for workers at home, the administration has been looking for new ways to make sure trade policy serves workers' interests. One difficulty that we can easily see is that, of course, not all workers' interests align. Everyone is theoretically a worker, right? Say for perhaps the, the very young or, or perhaps the very old. The language used by this administration is that it wants workers, the whole community of workers, to have a seat at the table. But what do they really mean in saying that? Well, we see that it might mean that they're talking about underrepresented groups, marginalized voices, those, even those that have been involved in trade discussions, but whose voices have not had significant attention or not received significant weight in shaping trade policy. So the, the administration to, to deal with this has gone out and tried to reach out to these groups. It's called up some of these representatives of different groups that I've mentioned and asked, what, what do you think we wanna bring you into the conversation on trade? And although it's done this outreach, there's still been some criticism that the 
administration's view of the worker is overly limited. Why do we think that? Well, if you look at where Ambassador Tai, the US Trade Representative, has gone, apart from Geneva, which we mentioned before, she has gone to Michigan, she has gone to Wisconsin, and she has gone to Pennsylvania. Now, these are places that are traditionally associated with uh, white male manufacturing workers, which was also the focus of the last administration. These are places that, of course, are hot political uh, areas for votes in, in close elections. And, and I should pause to say that these were similar trips to those that were made by the US trade representative at the beginning of the Obama administration. If you look back now more than 10 years, the US trade representative at that time also went to Michigan. One of his first trips was to Michigan, which is where many of our, our auto uh, industry is based. Uh, so he went there as well, but the messages were very different. If you compare what Ambassador Kirk at USTR uh, said in 2009 with what Ambassador Tai said earlier this year, the messages differ in the following way. Ambassador Kirk said, we want, we are here workers uh, to help create markets for you. How can we help you build your exports? Ambassador Tai's remarks are much more about how do we support your work here at home? How do we keep you here at home? And how, what can we do for you here on the ground in Michigan? There's also been talk about digital trade. Digital trade, very hot topic all over the world. What does helping the digital worker look like? What about migrant workers we could add to this list? In fact, migrant workers, uh, that is a, a group that uh, other governments have raised concern about what's happening with migrant workers in the United States. To the extent this administration is seeking to ameliorate uh, those issues, it's not doing it very publicly or loudly. So it seems the administration does not disaggregate in its workers at home approach. And that makes many people think that the message is hollow. They, they feel that their voices are not necessarily heard, even among the groups that are being reached. Uh, the administration seems to be setting up mechanisms to have voices heard, but it's not very transparent about that. It's set up studies, it's asked the International Trade Commission, which is an independent agency, in the US government to do a study on how trade impacts have occurred in, in affecting different groups around the country. But then you have the lawyers asking. So that's the sort of the popular view of this idea of the workers at home. Lawyers then asking, well, where are we going with this? What sorts of policies does this look like? If you look, what are the policies that we have so far? They are things like something called Buy America, an emphasis on encouraging companies that work with the federal government to buy only American-made goods, to put pressure to bring more American goods, American-made goods at the top of the list and encourage US manufacturing. There's more to come, I think, in that area. More talk about what we call reshoring, bringing companies back home from abroad, nearshoring, bringing them back to the region of North America or the Caribbean, co-shoring, uh, different aspects that say, we want to do more for workers at home because we want these industries to return. And many, many trade analysts look at this and say, this is protectionism at best, and this is not liberalization. So this workers at home policy seems very much in contrast, uh, they would say, to the, the rules of our, of our international trading system. So these are policies that may help workers at home or they may not, that remains to be seen, but a great deal of concern over whether they are consistent with the rules, whether this administration seeks to change those rules to favor them, or will just live in violation of the rules and we have to go forward. But in this first piece, this first bucket of workers at home, I think there's a lot yet to come. This is the least developed of the Biden administration's worker-centered trade policy. We have to see how much of it gets implemented and what it will look like in the coming months. But I should pause to say that Ambassador Tai herself has made clear that to help workers at home, that is not something where trade policy as we traditionally know it is necessarily going to be the top of the list. That's something that requires domestic investments. That requires the type of initiatives that we've seen major legislation moving through Congress as of late to increase US competitiveness, to help research and development, and the list goes on. So it's not all about trade policy to help workers at home something that I think is, is difficult for the trade community to want to hold on to. Let's turn into workers abroad. 
workers abroad is a very big umbrella, a very big umbrella. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the United States has these labor provisions in its trade agreements, and that's where we'll focus our attention in my brief remarks today. Again, these are commitments by governments to have a certain labor standard and to enforce those labor standards uh, in their own territories. They make those commitments in trade agreements. Every U.S. trade agreement uh, since 1994 has something like this. And over the last 30 years, they have grown in scope. They have grown in scope. There's more of them. They do more about different aspects of labor substantively, procedurally. There's more in these labor chapters. And there's also more enforcement. You are back to that key word. There are more enforcement opportunities in these agreements. And they've evolved from a relatively narrow set back in the original North American free trade agreement where it says, oh, there's here's one area of, of labor policy where let's say if Canada does something wrong, the United States could ask for an arbitral panel to review that activity and decide whether it's in breach of the agreement. So what we're talking about here is a potential arbitration, a state-to-state -state dispute settlement mechanism, like you see in other areas of international law, that would be set up where one government thinks the other government has failed on its labor commitments. I won't go through the whole history of how these have evolved, but uh, take my word for it, they have come a long way from their original uh, position. And indeed, other governments have followed suit, putting them in their own trade agreements uh, around the world. So as we came into the last two administrations, there was a lot of review of these labor chapters. We were asking the question of whether they had succeeded. Are we actually improving labor standards? And is this good for workers all over the world? Three different ways to measure this. One is to ask, are we achieving labor reforms in places where we thought their labor laws were substandard? And the answer looking at the, these, at the experience was yes. In fact, these negotiations that we're having around trade agreements are actually helping many trade partners uh, uh, raise their standards to get to the point of the International Labor Organization's convention standards and making necessary reforms to do that prior to signing the agreement. So that was a big success. Second, are we creating dialogue to deal with labor problems as they arise? There again, yes, these trade agreements find have means by which the trade and labor officials can be in dialogue about different labor problems under the laws that have been uh, agreed. So there we have, again, success in cooperative labor dialogue. Where we have not had success in the last 30 years is on that enforcement piece. And that, I think, has precipitated the greater emphasis on enforcement as of late. There has only been one, one full deployment of that mechanism that I described a moment ago, where one government sues the other government for violation of a labor chapter. This was a case the United States brought against the government of Guatemala. The government of Guatemala was accused of failing to effectively enforce its labor laws. And so to prove this before an arbitral panel, the United States collected dozens and dozens of worker statements from Guatemalan workers all over the country, different industries in Guatemala, where the workers were saying, our acceptable conditions of work are failing. We've raised this with the government. We've tried to unionize and we've not been allowed to do so. And the government has not come to our aid. So this collection of evidence presented to the panel to say, Guatemala is in breach of this Central America US free trade agreement. The panel agreed. The panel said, yes, we do think Guatemala is in violation of this trade agreement but only insofar as it comes to the failure to effectively enforce its laws. It's not a breach of the trade agreement in full because it was not in a manner affecting trade. The language of the Central America US free trade agreement requires the complaining government, the United States in this instance, to prove that these failures had an effect on trade. And there the panel said that had not been shown. So this was, from the US perspective, a big loss. Right? Guatemala was not in violation of the trade agreement. It didn't have to change its ways. There was no penalty. And here in a country that seemed to have the biggest, most, most concerning problems of many governments around the world, we couldn't get the job done with these trade agreements. That led to the need for great change. And the change came 
in this most recent US-Mexico-Canada agreement, which adds a new mechanism created between a, a, the Democrats in Congress and the last administration, they put this in there with the big political compromise, and now this administration is using it, and it's using it very actively. What does this tool do? It's called the rapid response mechanism. You imagine people sort of coming out of the woodwork trying to do this, like rapid response to something. What does that actually mean? It's intended to be a quick way to address a labor problem at an individual work site in one of these three countries, US, Mexico, Canada. What could happen is the following. If the government of one country, let's just take an example, let's say it's Canada. If Canada thinks that there is a work site in Mexico where the business is interfering with labor rights, not allowing the workers to unionize, for example, it can then stop at the Canadian border any goods that are coming from that factory until that problem is resolved. So it's instantaneous. When Canada says there's a problem, these people are not being allowed to unionize, at that moment, any shoes, t-shirts, whatever's coming from that factory, they get stopped at the border and not allowed to enter. That's the idea behind this rapid response mechanism. And there have been two uses so far, both of which involve Mexican work sites with concerns being identified by the US government. The first one involves pickup trucks. Gotta love the pickup trucks. It's the centerpiece of Americana. Right? I don't see many of these pickup trucks around here. No, I, of course I've only been here this week, but uh, not many. They're not out there. No, um, where I live in Virginia, they are everywhere. They are everywhere. Pickup trucks. Yes. Well, these pickup trucks are made. They're put together in the middle of Mexico at a General Motors, big U.S. auto company. A General Motors facility. It's an it's a assembly line manufacturing facility where they finish off these trucks are called Sierra trucks. Right? And that's where they're made. Well, the US government received a tip from a hotline. There's a hotline set up for this rapid response mechanism. An anonymous tip comes into the hotline that says the workers who are making these Sierra trucks, they're not being allowed to unionize at this work site. That's a violation uh, of this USMCA. So the US government took this tip, talked to the Mexican government about it, the Mexican government agreed. The evidence suggests that the workers of the GM factory are not being allowed to unionize and there needs to be, something needs to be done. The Mexican government and the US government developed a plan. That plan was implemented and big success. Earlier this year, the governments announced that the problems had been ameliorated. International labor organization observers came in to monitor the vote, and all is well now at the GM factory. But remember, in that intervening period, those Sierra trucks were not being allowed to enter into the United States until this was resolved. Um, I should hasten to say that um, we are actually owners of a Sierra truck in my household, and upon hearing about this, we discovered that the Sierra truck that's sitting in my very garage came from this factory. Uh, so if that was a sign that uh, I should be studying this, I think it is clear. <clears throat> Go on to the second example, the use of this rapid response mechanism. This is at an auto parts factory. Again, here we are in automobiles, about a thousand meters from the border of Texas, thousand meters outside of the United States there in Mexico. And there the US government said the workers are being harassed. The workers at this work site are being harassed uh, and they're being terminated for attempting to organize. This time, interestingly, the Mexican government disagreed that we don't think this is a violation of the trade agreement. And ordinarily, that should mean there should be an arbitration panel set up to investigate that. But the United States took a different approach, not set out in the agreement, uh, which was negotiate with the parent company, which happens to again be a US company <laughs> based in Philadelphia. They came up with a plan, and that seems to be moving smoothly. We don't have a lot of additional detail. So this new tool, right, let's help the workers in Mexico, let's help the workers abroad, that's been the centerpiece of this worker-centered trade policy from the summer and the fall. And in terms of how it's been received, I think there's, again, this, this call more and more, we want to see more RRM use, we want to see more of these work sites being fixed. Um, my own view here is that this is the type of thing where you don't necessarily need to count the cases to feel successful. That what we want to see is to have this have deterrent effect that work sites don't need to be called to the floor for this type of behavior at all. But right now, the message is we need more, more, more of the use of this tool. 
in my uh, short remaining time, let's go to the final bucket of workers under duress. Forced labor quickly has risen to the very top of the agenda of this administration, but it is not just uh, something that is new to this administration. This has been underway for the last couple of years. Efforts by uh, US agencies to, to uh, deal with forced labor, to stop forced labor, have been in place now for, for many months. Uh, but this administration pushing it very strongly in multiple agenda, and not just in its own unilateral uh, conversations and efforts, but also in multilateral and plurilateral settings. So what's happening? Well, we have a tool. This is the inside the US option. The, the US has a tool that allows the Customs and Border Protection Agency to, again, stop goods at the border where Customs believes that these goods have been made with forced labor. Anywhere in the supply chain, any forced labor comes in and that good arrives at a port in the United States, it's not coming in. It's not coming in. That's the effort that we have. That's a tool that's, that's 90 years old, but it's rarely been used until the last couple of years. Where is it being used? It's used to deal with textiles from Xinjiang, region in China that I think internationally is known to have forced labor issues. Uh, agriculture also from different parts of China have been uh, dealt with in this way. Some individual shipping and fishing vessels uh, on the list. So really stepping up the efforts here uh, has been the US government trying to do this through its own tools. And as I said, putting it on the agenda for all governments with which it works, right? Because why? We don't want to just stop forced labor goods from coming into the United States. They just go somewhere else. Right? We need to be able to deal with them as a, as a collective effort to stop them from any market being available for such goods. You see this also the United States put forced labor on the agenda in the fisheries subsidies negotiations at the World Trade Organization. These fisheries negotiations are moving along slowly, but very important to the organization. And there the US said, let's add a forced labor uh, commitment to it. And it seems that other governments have hooked on to that. It's a little fisheries time here to make sure everybody's still with me. <laughs> Uh, and so now, despite all this goodwill and activity surrounding forced labor, there is still quite a bit of divergence among the stakeholders as to how. How should this work? That's a thread that actually runs through all the three buckets that I've talked about today. For workers at home, for workers abroad, for workers under duress, how should we properly do this? So this again takes us back to how is this general world worker-centered trade policy being received? The idea is good, right? We want to help workers who are being forced to, to work against their will. And who could be against stopping forced labor? We want to help workers who are not getting access to internationally recognized labor rights. We want to help workers who have lost their jobs due to trade or, or uh, digitization or automation related to trade. But how should we do this repeatedly becomes the question. How do we do this consistent with liberalization rules, or do we need to reimagine those rules? You have businesses coming forward, both on the forced labor front, as well as on this rapid response mechanism, uh, saying we, we, these are unworkable tools for us in your worker-centered trade policy. We can't be sure we have uh, no forced labor all the way down. We, we can't control all of what's happening in the factories. We need uh, better and, and clearer guidance on these. So this is a place where this administration has had a different emphasis from the last. That is to help the US economy thrive. This administration says, we must help all workers and we want to support companies at home. The last administration by contrast said, we want to help US workers. We want to bring companies home. And so there's a shift in tone, a shift in emphasis. And it seems premature at this point, only less than a year into this administration to say, to talk about success, to talk about evaluation. And there's even less time for many of these officials uh, to have been in their positions. But if we run a comparison, if we run a comparison between the two administrations, we could say, yes, there's a lot of continuity. Yes, many of us are impatient to see more, but this is not an administration that has been sitting on its hands far from it. I've mentioned many of the developments today. We will continue to have concerns about the future direction. That is clear, but it is not back to business as usual. We have to address these troubles in new ways and too much has changed to go back to the policies of 2016. 
Finally, because it's easy to call almost any action worker-centered, I think that that message will continue to be at the cornerstone of this new administration's trade policy. The challenge will be, how do we fit many other priorities within it? Let's just take climate change, for example. Let's take environmental concerns. There is a, a, a area that where we need to make developments and we need to make policies, but we have many different competing workers that are very differently situated. Just take solar energy, for example. Solar is one of those, those, uh, those industries that has so many different facets with workers who have very different priorities when it comes to how trade policy should work. So trying to reconcile these interests about climate change and others together with the worker-centered trade policy remains to be seen. But as the United States experiments with these new means, with these new ideas by which to ensure that workers are at the center, these conversations I think will continue to evolve. So we need to watch this space and then take advantage of the space to work with willing partners in making it all happen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for this um, very insightful presentation. I have never seen such a, a, an engaging presentation delivered to an FFP mouse. I must say, it's really the first time, never happened before. Um, I'm the one who's standing between the presentation and the Q&A session, so you didn't attend um, this, uh, this event because of me. I would like to hand it over to you for your question to, to Kathleen. Please. Roll. Do I need a microphone? Yes, that, that, there is one coming to you. So. Well, uh, Kathleen, thank you very much for your most enlightening presentation. Uh, if I may, I would like to be more legalistic uh, and uh, not so much uh, policy oriented. And I'm uh, very much. Uh, uh, interested in the question to what extent do you think that the Biden administration is going to change the attitude towards uh, the two different uh, security exemptions in the GATT Article 20 and in the GATT's Article 14Bs. On the one hand, I would like uh, to ask the question in respect of uh, services. Do you think that the quite broad public policy and security exception could be invoked by the Biden administration, as many countries uh, do, and as the Tr Trump administration did. And secondly, and more in the core of uh, your presentation, what about the GATT exemption on um, health and life as far as, for example, forced labor is concerned? Could it be that the Biden administration is all of a sudden invo invoking Article uh, 20B on health uh, of uh, labor forces? Very good. Okay, thank you so much all for the uh, very thoughtful question. And uh, again, uh, so delighted that you could join us. You are truly the expert on, on these topics. Um, I will try to look into my crystal ball, uh, but it's not always delivering for me on these issues. I, I think um, you mentioned first the security exception and what sort of, let's take that generally, what is the future of that and possible implications of it. Uh, as you know, and others may also know, um, the, the Biden administration has, of course, continued its uh, security exception defense in, in defending these uh, security related uh, tariffs. Uh, there's these section 232 tariffs that are related to steel and aluminum have been challenged in the World Trade Organization. And in defending those tariffs, uh, the prior administration and now this one has continued to rely on the security exception uh, in the WTO agreements. Um, and so I think that was much to many people's surprise, firstly, that this would actually continue to be the policy. Um, that's the same thing has happened indeed in the US courts. On the US courts, uh, there are a number of challenges to the tariffs. And there again, the Biden administration continues to defend them as the way forward, which of course it has to do so long as they're in place. Uh, and so I think until we find a more general solution to the problems that you raise, 
I think the security exception can continue to be a valid option and one, one that it wouldn't hesitate necessarily to use. Although maybe that's a bit of an overstatement. There may be greater hesitation, a greater a disinclination to use it, but not going so far as to say we will not use it if we need to deploy it. On the second question about uh, Article 20B, these exceptions that could be used to, to deal with uh, forced labor, exceptions for, for human health and so forth. Uh, first, I know there are there are student experts in the audience in Article, Article 20B for our great moot court team here at the University of Zurich. They're working hard on Article 20B. I had the pl pleasure of getting to know their work yesterday. Uh, there too, I, I suppose, I think I would say, Rolf, that, that the, the main focus is to try not to use that. The main focus is to try to get a, a collective effort uh, among governments where that argument uh, is not one that will that will be needed, that will fly, that is that is even uh, that needs to be a part of this conversation. And you're starting to see, I think, that um, uh, conversation happening. I mentioned uh, not only in fisheries but in other parts of, of G7, G20. Uh, those trying to create that norm in such a way that we don't need to rely on exceptions to make the point heard. So thank you again. Thank you. Uh, I'll pass out your next line. Th thank you very much. It's really a, a great talk you gave. Thanks. Um, so it looks to me a bit uh, that the good old days of, of, of globalization and, and free trade and so are somehow definitely gone, if I understood you correctly. But my question is more precisely this one. What now, where are we now with the attitude or the relationship between the US and WTO? Uh, you know, the applied body, but, but maybe also more generally, it looks like, you know, international rules, legal rules are more here to save and protect the smaller countries and the big guys somehow don't like them so much. So, so can you explain a bit more how the attitude with under the new administration is now? Sure, thanks. So the question, in case those in here, was about uh, the, uh, it worked, it worked, but just for those, <laughs> for those in the back, what is the U.S. attitude toward the, toward the WTO? Um, so uh, many things to say. Um, let's start with the first, uh, last week. Last week was supposed to be this ministerial. Many of you may know this was a big meeting uh, of all the um, uh, WTO members to try to accomplish quite a bit. It, of course, uh, was canceled uh, just uh, two days before it began uh, because of Omicron and the Swiss travel bans involved with that. Um, I think that was a great deal of disappointment, not connected to the U.S., but at that moment, many people said, oh, this is just one more right now. We have to deal with the U.S. disinterest. Now this is one more effort. Um, but uh, I, I want to say I don't think that's the end of the world. Or I think we're still making good progress on, on WTO issues. I mentioned Ambassador Tai went there um, and tried to make that point that we are here, we are engaged. My impression in spending some time in Geneva a couple months ago um, in, uh, in talking to folks there is that they, there's a concern about relevance that again is not limited to, to the United States involvement. But there is a concern if you talk and, and, and to people in capitals as well, what is the, the relevance of the WTO going to be going forward so long as US leadership and frankly EU leadership has taken a step back? There's this concern. The other words that are used are disillusionment, right? disengagement, uh, credibility. Um, and so what you hear from the US in responding to these concerns is that we have, we have to save it, we have to do more. Um, so I think there is this uh, commentary that's coming out of the Biden administration that says, we have not given up. Other people are saying they're concerned. Okay, we hear those concerns. Meanwhile, China taking great advantage to say, we're here, the WTO is great and so <laughs> forth. So now we have to sort of deal with those, with those comments. Uh, but I think so far what we hear from the administration saying, we're here, we're back, we're in the game. We are, you can see our participation in these ways. We're making a positive contributions. Uh, would everybody else like to see a lot more? Surely, yes. But bear in mind, too, that we don't have um, our ambassador even to the WTO in place. I mean, she has been nominated, but she has not yet been confirmed by our Senate. And so we don't, we can't until the Senate confirms her. Uh, we do not have her in Geneva, which, uh, of course, is, is less than ideal. But I, I want to say, I think, I'll leave you positively, Andy, to say, I, I don't think the WTO is the battlefield anymore. Right. In October of 2019, I said, this is one of the three battlefields. Right? This is where the last administration was doing battle. Um, that's not true. That's not true. The U.S. is there, it is engaged, and I think it will, it will continue to use the WTO 
to, to its benefit as much as it's possible and to preserve its values, again, um, in, to a large degree. Mm. Thank you, uh, Tim and Thank you, Kathleen. Um, it's great to have you back in, in Zurich and uh, thank you for your inspiring talk. Um, now, I'm not a trade expert in any way. Uh, I look at your presentation from uh, the wider field of international. Okay. okay. It's great to have you back in Zurich, <laughs> Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a trade expert, but I look at your words from a uh, from a from the perspective of uh, international law more generally, and I'm truly intrigued by what you had to say about about this new workers-centered uh, trade policy, uh, because you're not talking about the companies so much. You're not talking about states, but you're talking in the end about individuals, and. Uh, there, there, there's a lot, obviously, to say about the tectonics of international law and how this fits in into a state-based uh, international order, and, and if not. But I, I, was, I was wondering, um, does the Biden administration um, focus at all on rights talk? So does it give it a rights framing? Because in the end, if you talk about individuals, that's what you would come down to. You mentioned labor standards, but are we talking about labor rights? Uh, that's the first question. The, the other one is, um, I am uh, uh, very sympathetic to, to, to that approach because um, it, it opens up uh, the debate for, uh, or, or it, it lessens the, um, the, 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 the uh, probability that international law is used as a scapegoat for things that go wrong domestically. Um, I think we've heard a lot of talk about um, that the, the, the trade is responsible for all the things that have gone wrong domestically. And I was wondering, is there uh, a critical analysis about you know, the distributive effects of um, things going wrong at the international law level, uh, as opposed to things that have for a long time gone wrong on the domestic level? And do you see that, um, the, did you see this, this, uh, this effect that international law, once you adopt this policy, can let, less be used as a scapegoat? Is that, is that something that is in the mind, maybe even on, of the Biden administration? Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much uh, for those thoughtful questions. Um, let, let me start with the first, which is uh, a little easier than, than the second, which is, um, I think, very complex to, to answer. The, the first is uh, about rights framing. Um, indeed, we are seeing more of that. Um, I'll preface this by saying I think there's a great deal of uneasiness about bringing in rights framing into trade policy more than maybe already is the case. Um, and that's in part uh, perhaps uh, some uh, track record of the United States in some of these areas, um, but also because of what that might mean again for, for business and what that might mean in, in, um, uh, in content that we, we can achieve or cannot achieve. But uh, I'm involved in a study of looking at uh, the language of trade policy over the last, uh, since 1974. How has that changed in, uh, particularly in Congress, but also uh, in other statements of, of US trade officials? And what we've seen in sort of this, we're in early stages, but in the early um, results of this uh, Texas data study, uh, we see increased uh, commentary about rights. In fact, if you, if you look at the, um, at the hearings that are held with US trade officials, uh, in Congress and in the last couple of years, you start to see the appearance of even the phrase human rights, which you do not see in earlier years. So this administration, I think, is more inclined to try to use that language, to try to use those concepts in trade policy, uh, particularly as it relates to, to gender. That is one area where that has come up uh, most of all, but also, as I said, uh, more generally human rights and indeed also uh, in, in labor. Um, the last piece of that is, I think there is still some, what we say, interagency work to be done there uh, between what the State Department might want to, the agenda of the State Department versus what the trade agencies might want to do. And that is often an area where one has to sort of uh, find the middle ground. Uh, and that might be something that's happening uh, also on that question. The second question, um, I, can, I surely cannot uh, do it justice, but I, I have written a little bit about 
um, how, in fact, some of what we see in the US trade policy experience is a strengthening of international law commitments. Um, and I think has the effect that you're describing in some ways that um, to the extent we can find uh, ways forward for um, supporting international law in our trade policy, we, and in a trade policy that we can believe has success, trade policy that people can believe in, therein we are supporting uh, international law commitments and strengthening uh, the sort of general perception of the importance of international law rather than have it be the scapegoat. So, so that, and I'm happy to, to talk with you more about that uh, after our, our gathering today and, and send along this, this paper. But I, I do think that we are starting to see that shift to using international, to using trade uh, to, to support international law more than the opposite, some of that. Thank you so much. We have uh, about 10 minutes more for, for your question. We have one for the live stream. Um, okay. Uh, wait, yes. Um, the question to you, of course. Uh, what is the Biden administration take on India playing key strategic role both in the Quad and under the FOIP? Question mark. Great. Okay. Uh, so the question about India. So um, I think the relationship with India is complicated uh, and, and, and not a one that um, uh, has great clarity at this point in the administration. Um, most recently, our trade officials uh, took a trip out to uh, the, the region of Asia Pacific, talking with Indian officials uh, and in, in the course of that trip, as well as many others, to try and work through some of those um, dilemmas I think they're facing with India. There, there is a great push um, within Congress to do uh, an India deal to get something. There was some discussion uh, back around the turn of, of the administrations about a possible deal with India. What would that look like? Um, but I, I, I think the general feeling uh, is that and such a deal is, is, is beyond reach. If there can be a deal, it's going to be a very small one, something I call trade executive agreement, something that wouldn't go through Congress, but that would address a, perhaps a narrow issue on which the the governments can find agreement. Um, but I, I certainly think that despite these sort of uh, difficulties in, in, the, in the general relationship, that uh, the United States would surely view India as a key partner in dealing with the China issue. Uh, and that's something, a relationship that it would want to preserve. Thank you very much for your very comprehensive presentation. I would have a further question regarding the implementation of the U.S. workers' central trade policy, uh, because as you mentioned, the case of Guatemala has shown how difficult it is to make the link still between labor and trade, uh, um, the connection. And then we have the USMCA with very strong provisions, of course, and with minimal wages and for the auto sector. And Yes, and it's for me a little bit the question, how do we have to expect the US implementing the US worker trade policy vis-a-vis -vis other partners? Because we could see it with the EU, it was the Trade and Technology Council, and with the visit of US Chartai to Asia a few weeks ago, it was about recalling a bilateral dialogue with Japan or recalling the trilateral dialogue with Japan and the EU. So um, it's a little bit, Oh, it's still unclear how to capture uh, the U.S. central trade uh, worker central trade policy, and I would be very interesting on having your view. What could other partners expect from the U.S. in this respect? Great, thank you so much. Um, so the first thing you mentioned, uh, I think, was very, uh, very much uh, on point. Um, was about the, the emphasis on, on Mexico um, in, in what we've seen so far in talking about workers abroad specifically. That is a, a criticism, I think, of the way the, the administration is dealing with that workers abroad bucket, if I can use my own uh, reference. Um, the, there's a sort of myopic concentration uh, on, on the Mexican labor problem, perhaps to the detriment of, of other countries uh, making progress on labor issues. So, so just on that issue alone, um, you see a lot, and this is um, even to the point of, of dollars and cents 
that we've got money from Congress that's being forwarded to the Mexican labor effort when perhaps there's other, other labor issues in the world that we want to be dealing with and not the, the funding to support it. So that's uh, one thing that I think this, this over-concentration on Mexico has, has created. But your question then went on to, to something I think even more important about uh, how, we, how we might work together with others on, on addressing these same concerns that they might also have. And, and I'm sure you as the expert and others in the room uh, may know that uh, I mentioned other countries have similar agreements. Uh, they have that is similar commitments under uh, the EU, for example, as these sustainable development chapters that often follow the US agreement language. Um, but if they follow it too closely, they might also fall into the same difficulties as the United States did in the Guatemala case. So I actually think that the U.S. experience, particularly the USMCA rapid response uh, progress, has precipitated interest from other governments to look at this more closely, to ask what other tools do they have in their own toolkits to start to, to work on these same issues. Um, but that's most true in forced labor. That's most true in forced labor where uh, I've been a part of a dialogue with um, uh, between U.S. and EU officials to see what is it that the EU can learn from the U.S. experience on forced labor. That tool I mentioned about stopping goods at the border and so forth. The European model has largely been much more about due diligence, uh, asking companies to follow certain uh, requirements, as many of you may know. Um, and, and so how do we actually find a border measure, something of the sort that the U.S. has to deal with these issues. So there seems to be interest from partners in learning about how these experiences have gone, what have been, what are the best practices, what are the lessons learned. Um, you hear that coming out, um, maybe in less public ways, but I, I, that certainly is, is occurring. And even in the public settings that you mentioned, whether it's the Trotty Lab or the, the Technology Council and so forth, all of those statements, I think the U.S. is pushing for commitments that draw attention to labor issues, whether it's on the forced labor piece most strongly and then perhaps most easily, but also on asking uh, those partners to think about what does this mean for each of our workforces and how can it benefit uh, those people on the ground. Thank you. We probably have uh, time for one more question, which usually sets the bar too high, but we shouldn't. Uh, so, uh, Anyone who wants to come forward? Is there anyone from the live stream now? Probably not. So it's up to you, please. Yes. Sir. There. Uh, yes, thank you for your presentation. Um, the last decade, we had a lot of development in uh, like uh, optimization and AI um, for like. Uh, for instance, in companies like Amazon and uh, Tesla. Um, so let's focus on the uh, trade policies in the US for uh, home workers. Um, what is like the, imp the impact of, the, of this development for the next few decades? Is this a job uh, the current administration of the Biden administration has to deal with or is that the job of the future administrations? Great, uh, a very important question. Thank you for that. The, um, I think this administration very much thinks it is something that it wants to deal with, it needs to deal with. Uh, it's something that should be front and center of our mind because uh, I, I mentioned only very briefly the digital workforce, right? The idea of digital trade deals are, are now uh, front and center as well in many conversations. In fact, although the Biden administration has, has said it's not going to conclude any big free trade agreements anytime soon, that, that's that been its commitment, uh, but uh, it might entertain, so it seems, there's a rumor out there, it might entertain a sort of digital deal that would support the industries that you mentioned. It's also doing that through these other domestic uh, initiatives that uh, uh, I mentioned earlier, this through our, the R&D provisions, research and development provisions in recent legislation. Um, and, and, and on the trade side, again, uh, trying to deal with hindrances to those industries, um, whether this is a little beyond what you suggested, but say the digital services taxes, this is something that was uh, discussed a great deal in the last couple of years, where particularly on this continent, uh, there was an initiative to put uh, taxes on, uh, on some of these um, uh, digital companies or digitally focused companies, you know, Amazons and, and others, um, and to try and bring that down and come with a new solution to that, uh, that controversy, right? There's, there's a threat that that could end up in with more tariffs uh, on 
uh, countries uh, here and elsewhere. Um, <laughs> and that's the digital services companies <laughs> worrying about their future. No. Um, uh, so all this to say, let me just sum up by saying, I think it's very much on the minds of the administration. Uh, that's the true and the domestic agenda. It's true on the trade agenda. Uh, and that's part of what I think we mentioned earlier, this tech council with Europe that's saying, hey, we care about this. We think this is important. We're going to begin this dialogue to see how we can address uh, common issues. Uh, last, um, I, I mentioned Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, as a place where uh, the, the U.S. trade representative went. Um, often we associate Pittsburgh with steel, uh, but when she went, she was looking at digital futures, and she was talking about what can that, what will that look like? What are the different te technological innovations that we should be thinking about that's going, that are going to affect our lives? Um, so she was herself there saying, hey, this is important to me. This is important to our economy. Let's do all we can to support it. Thank you, and thank you, Kathleen, for, you, for these remarks, giving us insights into troubles, tools, and conflicts, or lack thereof, in the US trade policy. Of course, uh, we are here in Switzerland, are not, are not only watching these uh, developments closely, as other uh, WTO members do, uh, but uh, we are affected, of course, directly by the so-called uh, trade war. And while we're surely differing what we can do or would like uh, uh, others to choose to do, there is also much we have in common. you given us some uh, ground for optimism in what is still to come and provides, provided us a useful insight for understanding the nuances that inform the choices behind the scenes. Between the tariffs, the worker, the supply, uh, chain, uh, the, the supply, supply chain's demand and more. There's undoubtedly a great deal to think about for this possible, possible new concept of not just US trade policy, but also international trade law. The investments of the international community into a peaceful global trading regime hang in the balance. Again, this back uh, drop uh, again, uh, Thank you so much for coming here to Zurich. Uh, thank you, Thomas Dean, for uh, coming, uh, joining us here uh, this uh, this afternoon. Thank you for the uh, for, for to the to you as a director of the institute and to your staff for organizing this event. Uh, thank you all for coming and have a very good afternoon. Thank you so much. <laughs>